Um, I've mm -hmm. traveled to Ottawa today to make an urgent appeal for what I'm calling income repair. Living standards in Canada have taken a beating over the past few years. For many people, wages have not kept up with inflation. That's making it harder for almost everyone, almost everywhere, to afford almost everything. In order to restore our living standards, Canadian workers need a raise. But in order for that to happen, they need bargaining power. That brings me to the legislation before us. Bill C-58 is not a silver bullet. By itself, it won't reverse the erosion of Canadian living standards, but it's an important tool in the toolkit needed to help Canadians catch up to inflation. To illustrate why that matters, I want to share with you some results from a province-wide survey that Environics did for the Alberta Federation of Labour just a couple of months ago. That survey shows that the cost of living crisis is hitting my province hard. Six in ten Albertans say their standard of living has fallen over the past two years. Three quarters say they are worried about the rising cost of living. Among Albertans who describe themselves as middle class, two thirds say they're worried that the rising cost of living will make them fall out of the middle class. The situation is even grimmer among Albertans who describe themselves as working class. In that group, which constitutes about a thir two thirds of my province's population, 93% say that they are worried that the rising cost of living will prevent them from ever moving into the middle class. A month or so after conducting that survey, we released a report authored by economist Jim Stanford, who I think you heard from earlier today. That report, entitled The Disappearing Alberta Advantage, Advantage shows that Albertans aren't imagining things when they say that their standard of living is declining and that their wages aren't keeping up with inflation. Real after inflation purchasing power for Alberta workers is down 5% since 2018. For public sector workers, it's down as much as 10%. Even wages in our oil and gas sector are not keeping up. In Alberta, we've had the dubious distinction of having the slowest wage growth among all provinces over the past five years and among the highest rates of inflation. Even as our corporations, especially in oil and gas, have recorded their highest profits ever. The result is that the share of the Alberta economy going to wages and other uh, labour compensation has dropped by eight percentage points over the past five years, while the share going to corporations has skyrocketed. In our report, we describe this as perverse redistribution of wealth, and it is. When he was American president in the 1930s, Franklin Delano Roosevelt famously said that the best friend of business is a worker, is a worker with money in his pocket. That's tr as true today as it was then. If we want Canadian workers to have money in their pockets, then we need policies that bolster worker bargaining power and support wage growth. Allowing employers to use replacement workers is the opposite of that. Employers don't use replacement workers because they're concerned about the public interest. They use them to put the screws to their employees. As a former workplace organizer myself, who saw these tactics in action, I can confirm that scabs are a tool of wage suppression. And that's literally the opposite of what's needed in our country right now. On behalf of the 175,000 working Albertans I represent, I urge you to support Bill C-58 and send it back to the House of Commons with no amendments so that it can be enacted quickly. Let's add it to the income repair toolkit and, 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 to, the, and to the weight of precedence that can be used to convince more provincial governments to do the same. Thank you. In my opening remarks, I talked about um, uh, anti-scab legislation as being a tool and a toolkit that's necessary to grow wages, especially at a time of uh, high inflation and a rapidly rising cost of living. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen the inverse, right? So in Alberta, we've, we have a provincial government that has refused to increase the minimum wage for six years, even though inflation has gone up 18% in that time. No other province, every other province has increased the minimum wage. Alberta has not. They've made it harder to join unions. They've made it harder to uh, negotiate collective agreements. They've even introduced rules that make it easier for employers to avoid paying overtime. All of these things together, in my estimate, estimation, add up to a wage suppression strategy. And so this bill, uh, and, uh, you know, if, if another jurisdiction, the federal jurisdiction, uh, introduces anti-scab legislation, 
that will help put pressure on governments like ours to do what they should be doing uh, uh, during a, high, a period of high uh, inflation and ri rapidly rising cost of living. Um, that is the, well, first, I'll say that introducing anti-scab legislation at the federal level is important for the provinces, where, as you know, 90% of you know 90% of our workers fall under provincial legislation. But setting que set compris. yes, I've understood that. Uh, yes, that's the challenge. Important and setting an example. But the example that I would give from the Alberta experience is the TELUS strike of it's TELUS lockout of 2005, and that was an acrimonious dispute. It lasted uh, for many, many weeks. It affected the livelihoods of literally thousands of Alberta workers and workers outside of the province. And, and it lasted as long as it did because TELUS was able to scab uh, the work. And, they, and, and uh, actually, one of the reasons I'm really pleased about this legislation is because it doesn't make a distinction about how you scab the work, whether it's physically or electronically. Uh, that's what happened in 2005. They basically contracted out the work. Uh, they had uh, people outside the jurisdiction, even outside of the country, doing the work. And, uh, and to the point that has been raised many times before, that undermined uh, the, the workers' bargaining power and, and made a mockery of their, the right to strike. First, I think this legislation is bigger than unions. It's about all workers because unionized workplaces are bellwethers in the, in the labor market. Um, and as I said in my opening remarks, we have a problem of declining living standards, wages are not keeping up with inflation, and so we need champions in the labor market who can negotiate wages to pull themselves up and in the process pull everyone else up. That's always been the role of labor uh, in both the public and private sector. When we negotiate good agreements, it pulls everyone else up. Um, on this, directly to your question, will this discourage uh, people from joining units will make it harder for us to organize. I would ac actually argue the opposite. Uh, and, and I mentioned that I, I was an organizer. And one of the things that discourages people from joining unions is fear of confrontation. Uh, but if we take uh, replacement workers out of the question, out, out, of, the, uh, out of the equation, uh, that gives workers more confidence that they will actually have the bargaining power necessary to negotiate a first collective agreement and negotiate wage increases. That will make them more likely, not less likely, to join unions.